Today we're in chapter 3. We're going to look at verses 17 through 21. And uh, it's basically a, a message that relates to Paul's encouragement to follow his example. So let's begin reading at verse 17. I'll read to verse 21. We'll get into our study. Philippians chapter 3, verses 17 through 21. Paul writes, Brethren, join in following my example and note those who so walk as you have us for a pattern. For many walk, of whom I have told you often, and now tell you, even weeping, that they are the enemies of the cross of Christ, whose end is destruction, whose God is their belly, and whose glory is in their shame, who set their mind on earthly things. For our citizenship is in heaven, from which we also eagerly wait for the Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, who will transform our lowly body that it may be conformed to his glorious body, according to the working by which he is able even to subdue all things to himself. And so Paul is continuing something he's already begun sharing about, and that is for the body of Christ to become mature in their walks with God. Now, he used himself as a model of a mature believer, and he had exhorted people, and we've seen this already, to pursue the Lord with all of their strength, and that exhortation was actually setting a standard to be followed. Paul was indicating, and we saw this in chapter 3, that genuinely maturing Christians would do that. Distracted Christians would not. Paul was in a Roman prison, and even though he was in prison, he retained the sharpness of his vision. He wanted to know the Lord Jesus Christ, and, and he wanted to spend eternity with him. But strife and pettiness amongst the Philippians would dull their vision and Ultimately, because it's, it's so sinful, it would, it would render their ministry ineffective. And that's why he begins here by urging them. He's urging them to use him as their pattern. He's encouraging them to follow his example. Now, that is basically an aspect of discipleship. It's, it's setting an example for others to follow. Every person in this room who's a believer in the Lord Jesus Christ needs to grab hold of what he's saying here at verse 17 when he says, Join in following my example. That's a very important principle for Christians because I believe a lot of people cop out in that. A lot of people don't really see the, the value of that, the value of being an example for the Lord Jesus Christ. You are a living letter known and read by all men. You are the only Bible that many people will ever read. And we need to understand and embrace that. A lot of times we may get away with telling other friends or believers, you know, well, you know, just give me a break here, you know, give me some grace. And, and believers undoubtedly will give us a lot of grace because we need a lot of grace. But the world is not as generous as believers. The world will see you and they will see you as a person who claims to know Jesus Christ. And then they look at you to see whether or not the things that you say line up with the things that they know about Christianity. And they're not going to cut you any slack. They're not going to say, oh, it's okay for you to once in a while get a little depressed and go out and drink. Or it's okay for you to spend the night at your girlfriend's house. No big deal. We understand. They're not going to do that. They're going to look at you and they're going to say, that's a hypocritical thing. How can you say that you're following Christ and living in this way? And so Paul is making it very clear that we as believers are to have examples and to be examples. And he wants to be an example for them. He wants to set an example for them to follow. In Luke chapter 6, verse 40, Jesus said, a disciple is not above his teacher, but everyone who is fully trained will be like his teacher. That's what you and that's what I as Christians are going to be. We're going to be like our teacher. And he's not speaking about some human teacher. Jesus is saying, if I am your Messiah, you're going to be like me. That's why the word of God tells us that we're being conformed into the image of Jesus Christ. And so as the Lord Jesus Christ doesn't go on a Friday night party or Saturday, you know, to, the, to, to, uh, to dance or whatever, he doesn't do those things. Even so, we see him as our example and we say, well, Lord, I want to be like you. What is it that you would have me to do? Father, I'm a bit bored right now. You know, I'd like to do something. What is it that I can do that isn't going to end up with me backsliding? And that's basically how I would pray as a, as a young believer before I got married. Now I'm married. I can't backslide. Marie won't let me. But when I was a younger man, you know, just like you, I got saved when I was 20 years old. And you know, it's Friday, it's Saturday, it's whatever. I'd like to go out and do something. I had to learn, I had to begin to learn early to do those things that are pleasing to the Lord. And to look for people in my life who could be examples of what it means to have joy and, and to walk in grace and to know what mercy is and how to love, all of those things. I needed to find living testimonies. I needed to find people 
who could be good examples to me. And God, over the years, has been very gracious to give me a number of, of men, and I've had godly women in my life that I've been able to see and to say, that's a person who knows how to live for Jesus Christ. Well, we're supposed to be like Jesus. We, we use him as our, as our example, but we also have others that, that we see in Scripture that can be examples. Uh, when you read your Bible, you see stories of, of people of faith and how they lived. If you take notes, you see this in James chapter 5. In James 5, verses 10 and 11, we read, Brothers, as an example of patience in the face of suffering, take the prophets who spoke in the name of the Lord. As you know, we consider blessed those who have persevered. He goes on to say, You have heard of Job's perseverance and have seen what the Lord finally brought about. The Lord is full of compassion and mercy. So he says, use the prophets as example. And then he specifically says, look at Job. And we, we already sang about Job, and we've heard about Job and the life that Job lived. A man who was a righteous man, even when God spoke concerning Job, he said concerning him, I don't have a man like him. This is a man who is a righteous man who hates evil. Job was so righteous that he was concerned for his children. And in, in, in the event that his children may have done something wrong, Job would offer sacrifices even for his children. This is the kind of man Job was, and yet Job went through tremendous suffering. You read it in the book of Job, and you see that Job went through things to the loss of everything he owned materially, to the loss of his own physical health, to the point where his own wife, looking at him, was bringing words of comfort by saying, curse God and die. What a great wife to have. Thank you very, very much, dear. I do appreciate your blessing and encouragement. Curse God and die. What a wonderful thing to say. But he had a wife who finally said, I can't take the suffering that I'm seeing you go through. Just die. Just, just die. And Job held on. And all of this, he didn't, he didn't uh, sin against the Lord. And yet, as you look in the book of Job, and you get almost to the conclusion, and the Lord begins to speak to Job and begins to reveal himself to Job, the words that Job says have, have, have uh, been in my heart for many years. I have heard of you with the hearing of my ear, but, I, but now I see you with the seeing of my eye. And he says, and I consider myself to be wrong. I, I abhor myself, and, 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 and I mourn this reality in sackcloth and in ashes. I, I am sorry. But what I found fascinating is God's declaration concerning Job is that he's a righteous man. But Job says, it's through the suffering and the things that I've gone through that I've come to really see you. I heard of you. I walked by faith and not by sight. I trusted you. But now I see you. I see you in the midst of my suffering. I see you for who you are. And so Job is used as an example. In James chapter 5, verse 17, he speaks of another man by the name of Elijah. He says, Elijah was a man just like us. He prayed earnestly that it would not rain, and it did not rain on the land for three and a half years. So he uses the prophets. He uses uh, Job. He uses Elijah. So you have people of faith who are testimonies. All you need to do is read the book of Hebrews chapter 11. It's called the Hall of Faith. And you can see person after person listed there, people who were used by the Lord who had tremendous faith. Both Titus and Timothy are encouraged to be good examples. In Titus chapter 2, verses 6 through 8, Paul said, encourage the young men to be self-controlled. In everything, set them an example by doing what is good. In your teaching, show integrity, seriousness, and soundness of speech that cannot be condemned, so that those who oppose you may be ashamed because they have nothing bad to say about us. So he says to him, in everything, set them an example. In, in 1 Timothy 4, verse 12, he says to Timothy, don't let anyone look down on you because you're young. Set an example for the believers in speech, in life, in love, in faith, and in purity. Timothy was a young man by Jewish standards. He was probably somewhere around 40 years of age. That's not young to many of us in this room. To me, it's young. But to some in this room, that's not very young. But in a society that placed a high value on age, because there was a belief that with age came experience, and with experience would come wisdom. And if you lived a life serving God, and you grew to an older age, people would automatically assume that you also had wisdom with that experience. But Timothy was a younger man. 
Timothy may have been around 40 years of age. And so Paul is speaking to him, and he's saying to him, in a society that values age, you are at a disadvantage. But if you're going to have an impact on people that makes a difference, then you're going to have to be an example. Set an example of a believer. And as they look at you, they're going to see what a believer actually lives like. I was 20 years old when I gave my heart to Christ. I began to teach the Bible when I was 23 in September of 1973. My first people who would sit under my teaching were my parents, my dad and my mom, my sister Madeline and my sister Rebecca, and a neighbor down the street and her husband. That, were, that was the first people who would sit under my teaching. So I was teaching two younger girls, younger than I, but I was teaching my dad and I was teaching my mom and I was teaching some neighbors who were close to their age. I'm 23 and these other people are in their 40s. How does a young man my age minister to older people? By being an example, by having faith and having love and walking in the spirit, by, by being sober even for the age of 23. By having an awareness that, that eternity stands before them and stands before me. And so without a desire to become popular or to use my humor or whatever to try and draw them in to be followers of me, I wanted them to be followers of Jesus Christ. I wanted them to know what it was like to follow the Lord. And therefore, I was very sober. And that's what you do. The very first Bible study that I ever taught, the very first one that I ever sat down to open the word uh, my mom would tell you this, uh, how this happened. But it was at my parents' house. We invited some friends over for a Bible study. My mama came walking in as they were there in the den. She was a great hostess, so she brought in a tray and it had some coffee and it had some, some desserts and mama was placing them down as a hostess so that they could drink coffee and they could eat the desserts and all. And I remember turning to my mom, and again, I was 23 years old, and I turned to my mom and I said, mama, that's a good thing. It's good to have those desserts, but we'll have them after the Bible study because we're not going to have anything to distract us from the Word of God. Because I've always believed that if you're going to hear the Word of God, you need to listen to it with reverence. You need to give it your full attention. And so that was an act of sobriety, of soberness, because I wanted to communicate from the very first Bible study that I ever taught to this day that when we open this Word, this is God's holy Word. This isn't, this isn't just a, a time where we're drinking coffee, eating some donuts, and talking about Jesus. This is something that is holy. It's sacred. We're opening the word of God, and God wants to speak to our hearts without distraction. And that's how it works, and that's how it should work. And that's what Paul was saying to Timothy. He says to Titus, you need to be an example. But to Timothy, he says, this is the kind of example you're going to be. You're a young man. How are you going to win the hearts of those who are older? How are you going to win their hearts for Jesus Christ if you act like a child? So act like a man. Act like a mature man. Put these things on so you can have an impact. And that's how it works. Even here in Philippians in chapter 2, we noted in verses 19 through 22 that he spoke of Timothy being an example. And we saw Epaphroditus in verses 25 through 30. And so people are called to be good examples. Now, in this passage... Paul is actually exhorting the Philippians to follow his example. This isn't the only place that Paul ever says that. In 1 Timothy 11, uh, rather 1 Corinthians 11, 1, he says, follow my example as I follow the example of Christ. That's a very powerful thing, by the way, to tell people, use me as your example. I don't know too many people who can do that. I most certainly wouldn't say, use me as your example. I wouldn't take that upon myself. But the apostle Paul could. Paul could say, use me. We'll see that later on. He even reiterates that in a more powerful way as we continue our study later on. But use me as an example. True story of a Lutheran minister who was incarcerated during World War II in a concentration camp. And not only did Hitler destroy six million Jews, but Hitler also arrested quite a number of others who were non-Jewish and millions who were not Jewish died in concentration camps. This Lutheran pastor was one of the individuals who was incarcerated. And as he was in this camp, went about his ministry because he saw the camp as being a place that God had called him to serve. And so he would serve in the camp. There was a, a communist 
who was also in the camp, an atheist. And this Lutheran minister would approach this guy as he did his ministerial rounds and would share with him about Jesus. And, and he even had asked him, would you open your heart to Christ and give yourself to him? And the communist said, I'm an atheist. I don't believe in God. I don't believe in your Jesus. I don't believe in your Bible. I don't believe in any of that. Leave me alone. But this Lutheran, go, Lutheran minister would go around and minister and continue to do so through his entire incarceration. Winter hit. And when winter hit, it was very severe. And in these camps, you really didn't have anything that, you, that was your own, that was your possession. You would have a cup that was given to you, and you would use that for your food, but you also used that for your body needs. And so it was something that you would use. That was one of your possessions. You also might have a blanket or something that was uh, you know, threadbare that you could use to warm yourself. And uh, that, this Lutheran had a, uh, a ragged uh, piece of blanket that he used as a shawl. And it was freezing. And as he was ministering to people, he came up to this one man who was freezing to death and without thinking took his blanket off of himself and put it on this person who was freezing and ministered to him. And as he did so and cared for this guy, he continued his rounds, and this communist happened to be there watching what was taking place. When he walked up to the communist, he shared with him, and he said, will you not receive Christ? And the communist looking at him said, what is Christ like? And the Lutheran minister thought for a moment, and he said, he's like me. And the communist looking at this Lutheran pastor said, if your Jesus is like you, then I want your Jesus. That's the power of a testimony. When people see the goodness of the gospel lived out, when people are actually serious about what Jesus is all about, it touches lives. And it causes people to be aware that there is a God who transforms. And so Paul says, imitate me insofar as I imitate Christ. Imitate me also, and that's what he's saying in verse 17. Join in following my example. Following my example. But he goes on and he says, and note those who so walk as you have us for a pattern. Now, teachers don't simply explain things. There are many people that are very good at explaining they can take a passage, they can give you the original language, they can give to you history related to that, they can give you information that is true and right, but teachers don't simply give history and explanations. Teachers don't simply speak the message, they live out the teaching. The message is something that first pours through the life of the, of the teacher and then is handed to somebody else. Paul said it like this when he was speaking to the Corinthians. He said, that which I received, I also delivered unto you. It came to me, and I give it to you. It is sifted through my life, and I hand it over to you. And so we don't simply explain. We live out the messages. And this message is lived out before people. In Hebrews 13, verse 7, it says, Remember your leaders who spoke the word of God to you. He says, Consider the outcome of their way of life and imitate their faith. Watch them closely and see how they live and watch how God blesses them and use them as a pattern. And so that's what he's speaking about. Now, notice how he says, note those who so walk as you have us for a pattern. Now, when he says that, he goes into verse 18 to say, for many walk of whom I have told you often and now tell you even weeping that they are the enemies of the cross of Christ. And so this is a warning. It's a warning to be careful of those who come into the church as teachers. He's saying false teachers are to be rejected, and they are not to be tolerated teaching. Uh, during the early church, it, it's so much different now, 2,000 years later. During the early church, the church often would meet in, in various places, but didn't really have established places of worship. They met often in houses. And so itinerant people, people who would move from place to place, often would come in and say, I am so-and-so, I'm a teacher of the Bible, and I'd like to have an opportunity to share with the congregation. You may or may not know this, perhaps you don't, some of you would, 
many of you probably don't know this, but we have on occasion people who will write me letters and say, my name is brother so-and-so, I'll be in your town and I'd love to come and share from your pulpit. And they do that fairly often. They'll write me sometimes on Facebook. You know, when someone wants to be my Facebook friend, once they're my friend, they'll, they'll write me a letter. You know, well, I've got this ministry, you know, and uh, I'd like to come to your church. And then I write back, listen, Raul, you know, you've got your own church. You know, stay over there. But they do. They, they will, they will and, and I've had people, check this out. I've had people who have said, we would like, we're, we're, we're a band, we would like to come to your church. We want to have two white limousines. We want a certain kind of water. We want to have certain rooms in certain hotels. We want $2,000 up front, and, and we want to sell our product. I mean, this on and on and on. And then they close the letter by saying, we'd love to come. And I say, of course you would. I'd love to go along with you, you know, drink some of that water and make some of that money. But that's what they do. And, and so sometimes people will actually contact you because they believe that you're going to make them rich. And even during the early days of the church, there would be people who would enter in and they would bring a message that was not consistent with the true gospel of Jesus Christ. And that's what Paul is talking about. It happened in the early church. John, in 2 John, verses 9 through 11, says this. John writes, whoever transgresses and does not abide in the doctrine of Christ does not have God. He who abides in the doctrine of Christ has both the Father and the Son. He goes on to say, if anyone comes to you and does not bring this doctrine, do not receive him into your house. When he says do not receive him into your house, he's speaking of the church. Don't welcome him to come to the church, nor greet him. Don't bless him. For he who greets him shares in his evil deeds. Don't be handing them opportunities to minister their error, is what he's saying, in the church. Because what it's going to do is it, it is going to affect the believers in their walk. And so Paul is speaking about that with great concern. Now notice how he says it. Many walk of whom I have told you often. Now I want you to see his heart. And now tell you even weeping. They are the enemies of the cross of Christ. What a powerful statement, by the way. Do you know that the church today doesn't even understand what that means? I am telling you, the church does not understand. There are many people in the body of Christ who are not, are not really aware of what the Bible actually teaches for a variety of reasons. Perhaps they go to churches that don't teach. There's a variety of reasons. They don't pick up the Bible and read it themselves. And so they're not aware of what the Bible says. And because they're not aware of what the Bible says, or because they don't value the Word of God, they think it's a collection of man's opinions and myths and stories, and it's just good philosophy and all. Even though they profess to be Christ, they, Christians, they don't really have a relationship with the Lord, and they're not hungry for His Word, so they're not taught it. They don't pick it up and read it. They don't meditate on it. They don't memorize it. They don't live it. It doesn't really mean that much to them. When they see somebody who's very passionate about truth, very often what they do is they get turned off. They think, man, this person's too, too serious. This person is too, uh, I don't know, it's just too, too passionate about things. I mean, come on, lighten up. When our church first began, you know, 29 years ago, I was teaching a Bible study in Ontario in the little place that we used to, to meet in. It was on Vine Street in the city of Ontario, Church of God, Seventh Day. And as I was teaching, somebody walked up to me after the study I knew who he was. He had planted a Calvary Chapel ministry. No longer was pastoring, but he came and spoke to me. And he says, David, and I said, and he said, yeah. And he goes, it was a, a good study. I said, well, thank you. He goes, but you're so serious. And I smiled at him, and he said, the gospel is serious. The gospel is serious. You know, eternity is serious. Heaven is serious. Hell is a real place, too. And so when you open up the Word of God, you ought to be serious about it. You ought to be sober-minded about it. You ought to really believe what it says is true, and you ought to preach it in that way. But not everybody has that kind of feeling about it. He says, many walk of whom I've told you often and now tell you, even weeping. Paul had a heart for the lost, but his heart was more for the Lord. And because he wants God's truth to go out properly and to know that false teachers were creeping in, undermining the work of God, 
It broke his heart. And he says, and I weep over this. One of the things that you can really see about your life is what makes you cry. That helps you. What makes you cry? What are the things in your life that will make you weep? What is it when somebody says, oh, you're ugly, that make you cry? You know, when somebody says you're stupid, that make you cry. You know, whatever. What is it that makes you cry? And here's something for you. Can you cry over the lost? Can you cry when somebody is teaching error and undermining the grace of Jesus Christ? Does that affect you? Does that cause you grief in your heart? You see, when I was a young believer, I made the mistake of thinking everybody felt like I did. I really did. And so I would come up and I would say, watch out for this and watch out for that. And you got to watch out for these people knocking on the door. And you got to be careful with those people at 10 speeds, nice bikes, but their doctrine's bad. <laughs> and, and I would say that. I would stand up and I'd say, you know, I was watching somebody on TV and this guy says he's a healer. And yet he's saying, what, Lord? What, what, what? And I'd say, you know what? He ought to ask God to heal his ears. I mean, if he can't hear... <laughs> And I would say things like that. I was real passionate about this. Man, people got mad. They would get up and they'd walk out. They were angry. How could you say that about brother so-and-so? And I would go, are you kidding me? I had a lady in this very church when we used to meet here before we built that sanctuary. Years ago, really, long before we built that sanctuary. And I teased my wife. I have a tendency of teasing Marie. She knows it's okay, it's all in good fun. I would never denigrate her on purpose or make her look bad. Everybody who knows me knows how much I love her. This lady grabbed me right outside this door and she says to me, I want you to know you offended me today. I said, really? In what way? And when? Because I don't want to offend you. When you spoke about your wife in the way that you did. I said, oh, I said, is this your first time here? She says, yes. I said, I would think so. I said, because everybody in this church knows how deeply I love my wife. I said, but if it offended you and I made you angry, I'm sorry. I didn't intend to. I said, where do you come from? What church do you usually go to? She goes, I go to the Church of Religious Science. I said, that's a cult. Now I gave you something you can be mad at me about. <laughs> Because it is. Because it is. And see, now, now I'm nicer now than I'm old. Because when I was young, it's, 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 this is what it says, and let's do I'm still that way. I just try to be nice when I say it. I smile more. <laughs> but the bottom line is, can you, and boy, this is really an important question. Can you weep? Can you weep when you hear error? Does it affect you when you hear somebody say, I was so in the spirit that I walked off the edge of the platform, hovered in the air, God suspended gravity, and then allowed me to come standing back on that platform. Does that offend you? That's when a, a, a well-known speaker said that. The church just cheers, believing that God suspends gravity for this man. And I, I weep. I say, this is wrong. You're taking advantage of people. You're robbing them in the name of Jesus Christ. How dare you do that? And it gets you upset because these innocent people are being ripped off. And Paul would weep. And that's what he's saying here. He says, I say this to you, even weeping, they're enemies of the cross of Christ. And what do you do? Rather than exposing them, you get influenced by them. So use me, Paul says, as an example. And those who have embraced the doctrine of God, use them as examples, but don't use these false teachers as examples. You see, deception is present. There are already, notice how he says, many walk of whom I told you, there are a great number of deceivers. In Titus chapter one, verses 10 and 11, uh, Paul said there, there are many insubordinate, both idle talkers and deceivers especially those of the circumcision whose mouths must be stopped, who subvert whole households, teaching things which they ought not, 
for the sake, he says, of dishonest gain. The apostle Peter in 2 Peter chapter 2, verses 1 through 3 said, there were also false prophets among the people, even as there will be false teachers among you, who will secretly bring in destructive heresies, even denying the Lord who bought them, and bring on themselves swift destruction. And many will follow their destructive ways, because of whom the way of truth will be blasphemed. By covetousness, they will exploit you with deceptive words. For a long time, their judgment has not been idle. Their destruction does not slumber. They will make merchandise of you. They will tell you deceptive words. Deception. Deception is not always addition, adding something to the gospel of grace. Sometimes it's subtraction. It's not saying that which should be said. That's why teaching the whole counsel of God is so important. Now notice how he says in verse 18, of whom I have told you often. I have warned you, and I've warned you again. I have continuously warned you about the bad influences that can be in your life. I'm certain that Paul would even name names, that he would mention them by names. In 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 16 through 18, he said to Timothy, avoid godless chatter because those who indulge in it will become more and more ungodly. Their teaching will spread like gangrene. Among them are Hymenaeus and Philetus who have wandered away from the truth. They say that the resurrection has already taken place and they destroy the faith of some. Paul did not have a difficult time when he had to naming names. And he said, watch out for these people. Now, here he is referring to those who live lives that deny the power of Jesus Christ. They could be some who profess to know the Lord, but they don't live for him. In Titus 1.16, Paul said they claim to know God, but by their actions they deny him. Jesus in Matthew 15.7-9, through 9, speaking in this way, he said, Hypocrites, Isaiah was right when he prophesied about you. These people honor me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. They worship me in vain. Their teachings are but rules taught by men. So who are they? It's not really clear. Some think that he may be referring just to the carnality of some of those who are true believers. He had already spoken concerning some in chapter 1, giving a description of them. And he had said in verses 15 through 17, they were filled with envy, strife, selfish ambition, and insincerity. But he also mentioned false teachers in chapter 3, verse 2, when he said, beware of dogs, beware of evil workers, beware of the mutilation. So those I mentioned to you could have been those who were mixing the grace of God with the law of God and bringing people into bondage. What he's doing is he's warning against those who do not follow his example. And as I mentioned, he said, I tell you this even weeping. I have deep emotion and I have strong tears and I warn you. Avoid these influences. As a pastor teacher, I can tell you something. I can tell you that as a young man, as a young man, when the Lord saved me, if I may give you a brief testimony just for a moment, he gave me a passion for something. It's a passion that's never left me. It's been modified over time in, in a sense that it's been shaped and matured but it's been a hunger for truth. I don't know if I've ever told you this. Let me say it briefly here. When I first got saved, I hadn't been a Christian more than uh, three weeks, maybe a month. Some Jehovah's Witnesses came and spoke to me and uh, gave me some of their material. And one of the things they gave to me spoke about the Trinity and said that the material said that the Trinity was a Babylonian concept that is not found in Scripture. Some of you may be familiar with that. Perhaps you've spoken to Jehovah's Witnesses. That's what they'll tell you. That's what they told me. I was 20 years old. Now, to put it in some context, you need to know that from the time I was 15 till I was 20, I was into alcohol and, and, and drugs. Really didn't read that much. I did read on occasion some comic books but I really didn't read real books because they were boring. 
my last few months before I got saved, I started reading, and I started reading various books that were, they were pretty good. But I was just getting back into the habit of reading, so I was really basically very naive and, and uh, untutored. I mean, I graduated high school with a D minus average. I just didn't do any of the work. I just barely made it out. And so I had very little experience reading anything, and especially things related to the Bible. And now I'm just a few weeks old in the Lord, and I've got Jehovah's Witnesses speaking to me. And they bring this material and give it to me, and they tell me that what I've been taught is error because, because you know, God is not some three-headed God. You know, they got this, the Christians got this from Babylon, and, and you read the material, it seemed to make sense. And so for some time, not a long time, for some time I began to think, well, they must be right, and Christians are wrong. Now, I never became a Jehovah's Witness, but I just didn't have an idea about the Trinity, whether that's true, the word is never found in Scripture, those kinds of things. And so what happened to me is I put that doctrine on, uh, uh, off to the side, and for the next two years, I kind of like just never really knew whether or not there was such a thing as a trinity. So I got out of the service, and when I got out of the military, I spent two years in the army, when I got out of the military, I was at my house, I was renting a house with a friend of mine in Whittier, and, and here come some Jehovah's Witnesses, and they knock on the door. And uh, they came walking uh, to the door, knocked on it, I opened the door, I said, hello, how are you? They said, hi, we're, you know, witnesses for Jehovah's Kingdom, and just want to talk to you a little bit about God and Jesus. And, and, and I, by that time, had, had kind of figured out, well, I think they're wrong about this. And so the first thing I say to them is, um, oh, yeah, I'm a Christian. Who oh, are you? I said, yes, and I believe in the Trinity. I, I said it on purpose, you know. And, 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 and out, come, out come the razor blades. You know, oh, really? And they start slicing me up. And the woman uh, who was talking to me says to me, uh, you know, it's, it, this is what it says in God's word. And she'd say, God's word says this. And then she'd say, God's word says this. And I'd say, but wait a minute. I know that Jesus Christ is God in the flesh. Well, I'm sorry, but God's word says this. And she kept saying that to me. So my response to that was, I know I've been taught the truth. I just don't know how to defend it. So I said to her and her friend, I said, can I talk to you again? And they said, oh, yes, we'd love to. Now, they thought I was a fish on the line. And so I said, great, come back next week. And so they said, we'll be back. And I went to the only Christian bookstore I knew. It was in Anaheim. So I drove from Whittier to Anaheim. I went in and bought a book called The Kingdom of the Cults by Walter Martin. And I went home. Now, you have to understand, I had smoked so much pot, I had lost my memory, maybe, and I haven't done it since. <laughs> <laughs> Except for medicine. <laughs> so my memory had been restored. So Walter Martin's book has about a hundred or so pages on Jehovah's Witnesses. And I read it and memorized great portions of the arguments that Walter Martin had. And I was ready. So when they came to the house the next week, which I found interesting because the gal who was talking to me asked me, what's your name? And I said, David. And she said, what's your last name? I said, Rosales. She says, oh. So she leaves and the next time she brings a Mexican gal with her. <laughs> like I'm supposed to say, oh my people, it is true. I couldn't believe that. But they come and they sit down. And she says, have you considered what we said? And I said, indeed I have. I said, every time I said something, you said the Bible says. She says, well, all of our beliefs are in the Bible. I said, so tell me when, where the Bible says that Jesus Christ is Michael the Archangel. Where does it say that? She says, well, the name Michael means who is like God. I said, I didn't ask you that. I already know that. I said, where does the Bible say that Jesus Christ is Michael the Archangel? Where does it say that? 
Well, it doesn't. I said, all right. And I started going through all of their doctrines with her. And I said, last time you were here, you said the Bible says. And now you're not saying the Bible says. And the reason you're not saying it is because the Bible doesn't say that. Now, let me tell you what the Bible says. <laughs> and, th and that's when I began to discover that maybe God had put something in my heart to share with people. I could tell you this. I could say to you that if I were not a pastor, I would be an apologist, because that's really where my interest is, apologetics. And if you were in our early church services years, 29 years ago, I did a lot more apologetics than I did Bible studies, because I was caught up with what do the Mormons teach? What do the Jehovah's Witnesses teach? How does this work in our lives? And over the years, I came to realize that I can't go up and pick a fight every time I teach. I have to bring them through the word of God. But my idea has always been related to what is called systematic theology. What does the word of God say about this subject? And there's a passion that is in my heart that I hope is in all of ours for truth. What does the word of God say? See, there's hardly anything that is more difficult for me than when I have shared with somebody and they've given me a question or said something that I had no answer for. But rather than just saying, who cares, I would go and research it, and I would prepare. And the next time they came over, I'd say, you asked me what this says and what this means, and this is what it means. So I wanted to have an answer. See, this is from scripture. Paul said, I weep because they are enemies of the cross of Christ. I weep because many are going out undermining the message of grace and salvation and mercy that is found in Jesus. And it was already happening in his day. And so he said, I want you to know these things. These people's influence on you will dull your longing to be with Jesus and will be a distraction. Because believers ought to long to be with Jesus. And by the way, um, the world doesn't understand that, that you would actually long to be with Jesus Christ. My son David, when he was a little boy, witnessed. He, 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 he was the kind of little guy who would actually witness. He's always had a boldness in his personality. And, and I saw him as a, as a three- and four-year-old uh, do things that I, that I would kind of smile in my heart. I remember somebody coming to my door, and my four-year-old David used to be right next to me, and I answered the door, and, and the person was speaking to me about something. There were a salesman, and David looked up at him and says, are you a Christian? David asked the salesman, are you a Christian? And the, little, the guy looks down at my son, and he smiles and says, yes, I am. And he looks at me like, okay, I got him off my back. And David says, what church do you go to? I mean, that was, that was David. He would do it in, in the store. There was a kid across the street, his name was Tommy. Tommy was a year older than Corinne. Corinne's a couple years older than David. And Tommy had a crush on my daughter. But David knew that I didn't want her, even at the age of eight or nine, or however old she was, I forget at this time, you know, I wouldn't want her to be going out with someone who didn't know the Lord. David knew that. So you know what David did? David told Tommy, you can't be with my sister and Tommy said, why? Because you're not a Christian. And David baptized him in the neighbor's pool. <laughs> I mean, that's what David used to do. I'm not kidding you. We were, I'll give you another David story. We were on a plane. We were on a plane flying home from Rome. We had gone to Israel, stopped in Rome. We're coming home. David and one of his friends were in the back of the plane speaking to an Italian man. And David comes to where I am, says, Dad, you got to come. We're leading a guy to Christ. David's just a little boy. I said, oh, this ought to be fun. Dad, you got to come. All right. I go to the back of the plane. There's this very handsome businessman, Italian businessman. And you know what David says to this man while I'm standing there? He says, Dad, we're telling him about Jesus Christ. Now, this is what my son said. He said, but he tells me he's a Catholic. Dad. He believes in the Virgin Mary. He's going to go to hell, isn't he?
and the guy's looking at me. <laughs> what do you say? That isn't my style. I don't do that. I looked at the man. I looked at my son. And I said, son, if this man doesn't know Jesus Christ, this man is going to hell. And I said, excuse us. And then I looked at the man and I said, you know, excuse my son. He's trying to share with you about his faith in Jesus. I said, and I don't want him to be offensive to you. And he says, no, that's okay. That's all right. I don't mind talking about religion. I said, really, where are you from? And he says, I'm from Rome. I said, you ever read the letter that was sent to your city? He goes, what letter is that? <laughs> the book of Romans. And I started sharing with him out of the book of Romans, God's plan of salvation, you see. And so I have a lot of little stories like that where we've been placed in positions. But the bottom line is, is the desire to see people actually know God. Does it make you weep when they don't? Or does it matter? Or does it matter? Have, have we, the church, gotten to the point where we say, go to hell, man. It's okay. I don't want to offend you. No, we have to love people enough to tell them the truth. We have to. Not offensively. Paul said, have I therefore become your enemy because I tell you the truth? We need to tell the truth. It's in the word of God. And Paul said, these people, and I tell you, weeping are enemies of the cross of Christ. You see, when David one time was talking to the neighbor across the street, he told the neighbor, I want to go to heaven. David was witnessing. The neighbor came across to talk to Marie and said, I'm worried about your son. I think he's suicidal. <laughs> no, his father is. His father is raising that son. No, he said, I think he's suicidal. And Marie goes, why? Why are you saying that? Because he told me he wants to go to heaven. Because in his mind, only depressed people think about heaven. But what David was trying to do was to get this man to think about heaven. And see, there's something inside of us, something deep within us, that I don't know, when, when you get sold out to the Lord, it's hard, it's hard to just live an ordinary life. It really is. Because you see people as eternal. You see them either going to become something incredible in Christ or something that is lost forever. You begin to see that. And Paul, that was his heart, having a hope of heaven. Now, these people are not heavenly minded because their affections are carnal and earthly. And notice, as I mentioned already, they are referred to as enemies of the cross of Christ. It's possible that they're saying that you don't need to live a crucified life. But Paul has already been saying that, that Jesus Christ embraced that cross to the point of death. He died on that cross. And, and, and his desire, he said in chapter 3, verse 10, was to know him and the power of his resurrection. He wanted to be conformed into his image. And see, these people were influencing, were not living a crucified life. So what does he say? Well, the result, verse 19, well, whose end, he says, is destruction, whose God is their belly, whose glory is in their shame, who set their mind on earthly things. And so he, he gives to us the result. Their end is destruction. That word destruction means total loss. It speaks of utter ruin. The outcome of their lives, the fruit of their lives, is ruin. In rejecting a life dedicated to the Lord, understanding his death, doom, he says, is inevitable. He says their God is their belly. When he says that, their belly, that's another way of saying they live according to their carnal appetites. They, they deny the complete work of the cross. They deny the, the need of a crucified life. They live according to their own appetites. And in denying the sufficiency of Christ, they develop their own way of salvation. Notice he says, whose glory is their shame. They glory, in other words, in what should cause them to be embarrassed. This may be in reference to the fact that they were yielding to the right of circumcision. And then he says, they set their mind on earthly things. That would sum up their teachings. They're not divinely inspired, and they don't direct their attention upward. See, Paul is teaching them to direct their attention to the Lord Jesus Christ. For him, to live is Jesus Christ. 
See, that's why when you're in the other sanctuary, that's why when you walk in and you look at that dove that's up there, we would see Jesus. That's, that's what I want for you. See, I realize, if you don't mind, let me share this very briefly, as if I could do anything briefly. When you walk into that sanctuary, you see this scripture here. I make all things new. These, these are scriptures that mean something to me. That's why we put them up. I, I want to remember that, that God makes all things new. He makes it all new, brand new. My life is brand new. And, I, and, I, and I'm blessed in that. He makes all things new. Over there, we would see Jesus. When you walk into that sanctuary, you walk into that foyer and you look up. Some people haven't noticed this, and they've been in the, in the church for years. And you have those pillars up there, those four pillars. We've had people say, when did you paint this? Uh, years ago. <laughs> I never noticed it, I know. You know, you got to start looking up. Your redemption draws nigh. I mean, what else? <laughs> but when you go into there and you see, we would see Jesus, that's what I want you to do when you come to this church. I, I want you not just to see the worship team. I don't want you just to see those who do the announcements, the ushers. I want you to see him, to see Jesus Christ. That's why we have, we would see Jesus there. And, and when you leave and we remind you, you're going into the mission field, all you need to do is look at the signs as you're driving out, a scripture and a reminder, you're entering into your mission field. We had an opportunity to gather, get into the word, to be equipped, but we would see Jesus. He makes all things new. And when we leave, we go into a, a place that rejects him. Remember that. And because that is the heart of this ministry. We don't want to set our minds on earthly things. We want to be heavenly minded people. We are just passing through and we are in Jesus Christ. We need to remember that. Now in conclusion, he says in verses 20 and 21, our citizenship is in heaven from which we also eagerly wait for the savior, the Lord Jesus Christ who will transform our lowly body that it may be conformed to his glorious body according to the working by which he is able even to subdue all things to himself. So Paul encourages them, press forward, gain Jesus, receive the prize. We're like a colony living here, a colony of heaven. We are people who are just passing through this group of people here is part of your, what you, we used to call your forever family. We belong together for eternity. That's why it's so important, seeing that we're going to spend eternity together, that's why it's so important to learn to get along now. Because we're going to be together for a long time. And so well, let's start getting together here while we're here. That's what we do. So we want to live lives that bring glory to the Lord Jesus Christ. You see, ultimately, we need to understand that heaven is our home. It's a guaranteed place for us. Jesus went to prepare that place for us. He said, I will come again and receive you unto myself, that where I am, there you may be also. So our citizenship is in heaven. But we are eagerly awaiting the Savior, the Lord Jesus. What's he going to do? He's going to transform our lowly body that it may be conformed to his glorious body. This body that we're wearing right now. If you're young, enjoy it. <laughs> enjoy looking down and seeing your shoes. <laughs> One of these days they will disappear, I guarantee you. This lowly body that's only really capable of living on earth will be one day transformed in the twinkling of an eye. God will take this body and will transform it and immediately conform it. And we will be in the image of Christ. Will we recognize one another? Yes. Yeah. I will walk up to you, and you will walk up to me someday in heaven. And I'll say to you, whatever I choose to say at that moment, it'll be nice, because we're in heaven. <laughs> and if you want to sit down, 
and visit for what would be called a thousand years? You can. Can you imagine that? Can you imagine what it's going to be like one day? No more weeping, no more pain, no diseases, no sin, no fear, no horrible sense of, oh, I'm so ugly or I'm so fat, because we're all going to be in perfect bodies except for Raul. <laughs> He says he already has it. <laughs> One of these days. That's the hope that we have, to be with Jesus Christ. That's our hope. You know, sometimes we talk about the rapture as our hope. No, our hope is not the rapture. Our hope is Jesus Christ. He is our blessed hope. And he will conform us into his image. And we will be with him. And we will spend time with him. And you're going to see people like Job. And you're going to see people like Abraham. You're going to see people like Moses and Daniel. You're going to see Mary. You're going to see so many people that you've only read about. And when you look at them, you're going to know them. You're going to know who they are. Then you shall know even as you're known. There isn't going to be a line of introductions. We're not going to have these little, little badges. You know, hi, my name is David. You know, I don't need no stinking badges. We're going to know each other. And it's going to be so good. And it all comes because of Jesus. It all comes because of him. So, Paul, why are you so uptight? Why do you weep? Because these people are enemies of the cross of Christ. Because they creep in, they undermine the work of God, they steal the joy from the church. And those who would get saved, they want to keep them from being saved. And it causes me to weep because they're God's enemies. But you, on the other hand, you're being conformed into the image of Jesus. And never forget that. And walk with him. Because our citizenship is in heaven. <laughs>